Okay, it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone to our first Dean's Lecture for 2021. It's actually our first Dean's Lecture since February the 22nd, um, 2020. So it's been over a year without having face-to-face -face Dean's Lectures and uh, it's such a, such a great thing that we're back together, even though it's uh, not everyone that's tuning into this uh, Dean's Lecture, but we're back together as a thriving live community. So welcome and thank you very much for this. Um, yeah, I think we should give ourselves a round of applause. I, I would like to start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather tonight. And I pay respect to elders, both past, present, uh, past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians present. 2020 was an incredibly challenging year for all of us and uh, no one needs to be reminded of how difficult that was. And so um, events like this and, and little milestones that have occurred over the last few weeks where people have started to come back to working on site and, uh, and being part of the MGSE community and the whole of university community has been fantastic. So we are reintroducing our um, events and traditions and, uh, and, it's, and we're all the better for it. So let's hope that it continues to go that way. Uh, but of course, we all did miss the personal and social connections. And um, as we do that now, it sort of, uh, I think, gives us a greater appreciation for what we took for granted. Okay, so the last time I saw Fazzle um, was uh, on a Zoom conference like we did all of last year. And uh, it was a pretty unique Zoom conference at the time because it was on Friday, the 10th of July, 2020. And um, with the spirit of innovation that COVID brought to all of us, it was Fazzle's retirement function. Not the best way to have a retirement function when you can't pat people on the back and shake their hand and enjoy a toast, but it was a great occasion and uh, we had lots and lots of people um, there to uh, acknowledge Fazzle's fantastic career, which even though there was a, a retirement date, he hasn't retired, there's still plenty of work going on. I'm sure he'll, he might get a chance to tell you about that, but he's just as busy as ever and uh, working um, all over the place. So uh, we are going to have you back, Fazil, and we are going to celebrate your retirement in the next few months um, uh, with, with uh, others who retired during 2020 and just um, um, do that back patting that we thought we were going to do. So let me introduce you formally. Fazil Rizvi is a professor emeritus at the University of Melbourne and at the University of Urbana-Champaign in the United States. He has written extensively on issues of identity and culture in transnational contexts globalisation and educational policy, higher education studies and Australia-Asian relations. Fazil is a fellow of the Australian Academy of Social Sciences, a past editor of the journal Discourse, Studies in Cultural Politics of Education and a past president of the Australian Association of Research and Education. He is currently working on a research project for the Royal Academy of Bhutan. Tells me that he talks directly to the King of Bhutan, so a very influential man as we know. And without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Fazil to deliver his Dean's Lecture on Creating Dynamic Cultures in Education Post-COVID-19. Thanks, Fazil. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, I really am very pleased to have been given this opportunity to restart the Dean's Lecture Series. Uh, I've enjoyed many of those, these lectures and they've always been exciting and stimulating and I hope I can keep up with the standards that has been set, but uh, just the same. Um, I'm really pleased that you are here and, uh, and, and, and are able to listen to me speak uh, in person and not simply in some distant location in virtual space. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we meet, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I want to pay respect to the past, uh, to, to the leaders and members of that, that community, past, present and future. But uh, beyond that, I also want to recognize that the land upon which we meet is unceded land. And I want to do some thinking with you about what it means for land to be unceded. And how is it that uh, that notion of unceded has been interpreted and how it has implications for us thinking about the space which we occupy and the way we live. So I want to start off by thinking about the notion of uh, unceded, what its historical significance is and what 
its com contemporary relevances. Now, to do that, I want to make a distinction which is quite familiar to most uh, social scientists uh, who work in this particular area and indeed to post-colonial theorists. Uh, the distinction between a settler and extractive colonialism. Okay, I want to actually make that distinction because I have lived in both an extractive colonial site as well as settler colonial site like Australia. Settler colonialism refers to a form of colonialism that involved attempts to replace the original population of the colonized territory with a new society of settlers. In recent years, you may have noticed there's been a great deal in the United States that has been discussed in and around what is now called replacement theory. The Fox Network, and Tucker Carlson in particular, is incredibly keen to point to the ways in which uh, there is great fear within a section of United States community about being replaced. Uh, basically, it is, if you like, the idea of the demographic fear as to how it is that the composition of the community might change. And I think Australia is one of those countries which is a settler colonial country. In contrast, extractive colonialism doesn't involve people settling, but it involves the exploitation of human and natural resources for the benefit of the colonizing power. India is one such country, and of course there are a number of others. New Zealand falls somewhere in between, but nonetheless, uh, we, uh, you get the sense of what the distinction is. Now, I think it's interesting to note that uh, in a, typically, in a settler colony, the colonizing power is uh, often able to overlook or ignore the wishes of the local populations, assuming that the land could be occupied without the permission of the local communities and local nations. Indeed, the assumption is of an arrogant kind. That is, uh, that we do not need to worry about those who lived in the land before. Okay. In an extractive colony, this particular possibility does not exist. The colonial authorities cannot overlook the relevance of the local people, their histories and institutions. And that is in fact the case, was in fact the case in India, where there was a great deal of give and take. There was a need to show deference to the local cultures and local traditions. Even if the colonial powers craftily exploited the local populations uh, for their own good and for their own benefits. Now, what is interesting about this distinction is uh, that this distinction suggests that the ways in which people related to each other, the colonized and the colonizers, dependent on whether it was a settler colony or not. In a settler colony, there was a very different form of intercultural exchange than it was the case in a country like India. So in other words, colonialism uh, was articulated in practice and in rhetoric in very different ways. We are looking at colonial spaces in both places, but the intercultural relations that were possible and that were, uh, that were even, that were encouraged needed to be radically different. Okay, so as a result, what we're looking at is a, is a fairly significant distinction because it determines or it indicates the possibilities and the practices of intercultural exchange. What I'm actually arguing here is that the, the intercultural exchange takes place whether you assume it to be settler colony or whether it is extractive colony. In other words, uh, but even if people ignore each other, there is nonetheless uh, some kind of exchange that is taking place. But, so the nature and the possibilities of exchange are determined as a result of the foundational conditions of whether it's a settler colony or whether it's an extractive colony. In India, there was a great deal that had to be done in order to make sure that, uh, this, uh, that the local interests were not completely ignored, as, uh, as indeed um, was not the case in Australia. So in a settler colony, the colonizing power is able to define 
the terms under which they interacted with the traditional owners, treated them as they wished. In Australia, for example, the occupation became the foundational conditions that determined the possibilities of intercultural relations between the indigenous people and the settlers. It allowed the colonial authorities to rationalize to themselves the policies and practices towards indigenous people. It felt um, uh, if justified in creating its own patterns of conduct without seeing any particular need to consult the local inhabitants. The idea of per permission from the local populations did not even occur to them. So as a result, there was a very different kind of relationship that we looked at. So uh, what this suggests is that the terms of intercultural exchange in different colonial formations, settler or extractive, varied and were contextually specific. <coughs> And that is, in fact, evident in the case of the difference between New Zealand and Australia. In New Zealand, settlement defi was defined very differently than it was here through the Watangi, Waka, Watangi Treaty. Um, and uh, there are other parts where there were different modalities of colonial formations at all, uh, as well. In an unceded settler colony like Australia, the Australian government simply assumed that the Aboriginal people will eventually die out. And when they did not, they created rules and regulations that defined the ways in which the Aboriginal people could relate to the colonial institutions. In colonial India, intercultural exchange in contrast between the colonizers and the, colon, 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 colonizers and the colonized assumed a really very different form with a great deal of give and take uh, with respect to the ways in which the local population related to each, each it, to the colonial powers. What this demonstrates is the foundational conditions of the ways in which you regard a particular space defines the terms of interculturality, intercultural relations. Now, nor are these uh, conditions uh, of intercultural exchange ever static. As conditions change and as demands emerge, so do the modalities of intercultural exchange. So in Australia, the colonial powers, however, could not entirely determine and impose the modalities of intercultural exchange. As a huge amount of research over the last 50 years in particular, Henry Reynolds and so on, have pointed out, despite persistent and often violent exercise of power, the indigenous people were never really politically passive. In other words, although certain rules of exchange were determined, they were not entirely embraced by the local public. The Aboriginal people continued to resist and struggle against oppressive policies and programs. Indeed, in my view, it is their survival through those conditions that we should also honor. As a, in addition to the kind of things that um, we uh, uh, now uh, articulate in our, in our acknowledgement. We should celebrate the survival, but also try to understand what made that survival possible and what can we learn from that history of survival in order to understand how we now in the contemporary era think about intercultural relations and intercultural understanding. One of, the, uh, one, of, one of the cross the curriculum requirements. <laughs> so what we need to do is to recognize that indigenous people displayed remarkable creativity in their attempts to preserve many of their cultural traditions. In other words, uh, the survival depended on how they were able to be, express their creativity so that uh, many of the traditions were preserved over the years. At the same time, they adapted to the changing social and political conditions, incorporating ideas from the outside and to their own conditions. In other words, the cultures were dynamic. They were changing through the exercise of that creativity and through the strategies of living with oppressive conditions. This adaptation involved developing strategies for managing imposed colonial expectations. In this way, their evolving cultural practices were dynamic, 
shaped by the processes of intercultural exchange and hybridization. Over time, the shifting conditions enabled new patterns of uh, intercultural relations to emerge. So in the 19th century, the patterns of intercultural exchange were defined by the terms determined by the colonial powers. But uh, through the, after the Second World War, these conditions started changing. So new possibilities began to emerge as to how they might or we might think about uh, intercultural exchange. So, for example, the 1967 referendum transformed the social and political space within which new patterns of intercultural relations became possible. The significance of 67 referendum was not only that Aboriginal people were now allowed to vote um, uh, en masse, but it was that it created new conditions for the exchange, intercultural exchange between the indigenous people and, uh, and, 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 and the, the settler community. As indeed did the Mabo ruling in 1993. It transformed the legal and political conditions, enabling indigenous people to make claims on their land, deeply troubling the assumptions of unceded land. So 1993 marks a major juncture, historical juncture, in which the notion of unceded becomes legally troubled, legally unsettled, and not only unsettled rhetorically in, in, in political claims of various kinds. Now, in my view, the major significance of the Uluru Statement lies in its attempts to transform the conditions, the foundational conditions, within which the relationship between indigenous people and, uh, and, uh, and others can be nego now negotiated. So it's not only about representation that Uluru's statement is uh, now making a case for, it is making a case for a transformed space of interculturality, of how the intercultural needs to be thought about in a radically new ways and radically different ways uh, which, is, which are characterized by symmetry of power and which are crea uh, created by uh, patterns of respect and uh, patterns of, uh, uh, in other words, Uluru's statement wants to kill the notion of unseated. Okay, that unceded is a notion that we need to completely abandon so that we can reimagine new ways of relating to each other. Now, in my view, the COVID crisis is one of these, uh, these major, major types of, uh, uh, of uh, transformative historical moments and hence the kind of work that social transformation and educational group does. We look at those kind of transformations and try to understand how that has implications for every aspect of education. In other words, transformation is a foundational concept because it actually allows the new possibilities to be imagined. And COVID, to my mind, has opened up a little bit the door towards uh, imagining those uh, othernesses, those uh, different transformed conditions of interculturality. So as we study intercultural understanding and intercultural communication and intercultural education, then we might want to ask ourselves always, what are the broader backdrops epistemically, ontologically, and morally and politically? against which we understand the very notion and very possibilities of interculturality. Okay, in other words, what are the conditions that make certain kinds of relationships possible? Relationality needs to be problematized in that sense. Now, what are some of the already existing conditions for interculturality that the COVID crisis has potentially helped us to recognize? In other words, we need to actually start thinking, just as I presented the analysis of the relationship, the complex relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people, we might start begin to think about how it is that uh, the conditions of interculturality might have changed over the past 12 months, okay, and what it is. And that's actually what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the lecture. How have the conditions been transformed not only what conditions we have recognized that were already emerging 
but also how those conditions changing and, uh, and have been changed as a result of pandemic. And those are the questions that I've been paying, I've been thinking about a great deal in preparation for this lecture. How has the crisis, the pandemic crisis, pointed to some of the limitations of the current approaches to intercultural learning in education? Okay, how has it actually said something to us about we need to think about intercultural education and intercultural exchange and intercultural communication differently as a result of the new modes of communication that have emerged as a result of the COVID crisis. So instead of seeing COVID as a problem, I'm trying to position it as a potential uh, opportunity to rethink some of the taken for granted assumptions. What are some of the new, 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 new pedagogic possibilities of intercultural learning after COVID-19. Now, the thing to actually say you know, almost immediately is uh, that uh, the COVID crisis has reaffirmed the claims that were made in early part of this century, around 2000, by sociologists like Ulrich Beck, the German sociologist, and the British sociologist, um, Tony Giddens. Uh, they basically argued that uh, our societies, as a result of industrialization, as a result of automation, as a result of changing patterns of work, etc., is becoming increasingly a risk society. We need to actually understand what they were talking about 20 years ago and how that might still apply in relation to our understanding of what risk societies are. There were three points that they made in relation to the risk society in 2000. The first, was that the scale and potential for pollution, contamination, and pandemics is increasing. In other words, we've got to prepare ourselves for not only COVID-19, but perhaps COVID-2023, but COVID-2025. How do we manage to live with each other? How do we actually talk to each other? And how we understand each other is a question that arises if we accept the thesis that risk society is going to continue to beset us and its effects intensify. The other thing that they pointed out, and this relates to education, that there is a loss of faith in experts, science, to predict and protect people from social, environmental, and technological hazards. In other words, they're saying that the hazards are going to increase but our capacity to use science and expertise is going to decline. Okay, now this is before Trump they're talking about. This is 2000 they're talking, okay? So in other words, they were actually observing a historical pattern that was emerging perhaps from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, okay, a few centuries earlier. And they were also argued, the third case that they made in relation to a characteristics of risk society is that they're increasingly competing knowledge claims, erosion of expert consensus regarding the management of these hazards. So the question becomes, how do we manage these hazards of risk society that are all around us, okay, and that are likely to increase and become greater and more intensified? So those are the questions that uh, uh, they, they, they observed. And in my view, 21 years later, we need to actually be thinking about those issues, those uh, uh, alerts that they specified a uh, little more seriously and start thinking about what it is that is likely to, 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 to be our responsibility to begin to manage these hazards of the risk society. Now, it is quite clear that there are a number of other things that we also need to recognize during, the, during this uh, 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 period of COVID and then post-COVID. Uh, we need to recognize that while people and groups of people are no longer able to move across national borders, and believe me, <laughs> I want to move, but uh, I'm stuck in Australia for at least 12, 14 months now, the levels of virtual communication are exploding, are really exploding. The number of ways in which people are in touch with each other and are developing communities is increasing. At any given time, there are 60 million, 60 million Zoom conversations taking place. 
not Skype, not others, not FaceTime, nothing, just simply Zoom. Uh, 60 million conversations are taking place now. And half of these conversations are across uh, national and cultural borders. In other words, the condition of intercultural engagement, cultures rubbing up against each other, is increasing. And of course, this is likely to increase even more so uh, as a result of the experiences and as a result of the opportunity that the business class has seen in trying to develop communication systems, improving them and trying to make them a lot more sophisticated, there is a huge amount of research going on as to how the communication, new communication systems might be worked upon, and as a result, they'll emerge. Transforming the nature and scope of the transnational spaces in which we now live and work. So just as I was talking about a condition that defined the settler colonies and its implications for engagement with indigenous and non-indigenous people, we are now actually having to think about how the new communication technologies are creating transnational spaces in which cultures are rubbing up against each other. I'm using the term rubbing up against each other quite deliberately. I'm not saying that they are exploitative, they are conflictive. I'm using much more neutral term about rubbing up against each other in a whole range of different ways. Now, as a result of all this, of course, the new modalities of work and labor relations are changing, potentially transforming the nature of the global economy. Just think about the rise and rise of gig economy in just the last 10 years. It has been huge, okay? And as a result, the nature of the relationships across people and across communities is changing at a very rapid rate. Um, so as a result, there are teams of workers and teams of projects that are between Bangalore and Sydney, or Bangalore and, 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 and Singapore. <laughs> um, I'm looking at somebody who actually works on this. People have been able to, as a result of all this, these communication technologies, been able to renew and strengthen long, uh, per, long lost, sorry, it should be lost, personal and professional links. So as a result, uh, just recently, I had somebody who I hadn't seen from my school days in 19, uh, whatever, <laughs> long time ago. <laughs> but, uh, exactly, long time. Um, got in touch with me and sort of said, you know, you remember me? We were went to primary school together. I said, yeah, kind of, you know, tell me more. And he told me more. And here I am, you know, now talking to him on a regular basis in terms of nostalgic and in terms of possibility too. One of these days when we are able to fly uh, to, to, to India, we'll start um, getting together again. That's happening all over the place. And as a result, the diaspora formation has become intensified. In other words, the transnational diasporas in particular are increasing at a very different. They're becoming consolidated. And, uh, and that in itself actually raises questions about when we talk about intercultural, then which are the culturals that we are talking about? Are we talking about the cultures within our borders or across the world? Well, of course, across the world, because that has become increasingly possible. The thing, other thing that has happened, despite the rise in anti-globalization nationalist populism, there is no significant diminution in the facts of global interconnectivity and interdependence. In other words, for all the talk about globalization not being as, uh, as good as it could be and all those other things that uh, anti-globalization people uh, argue, the fact is that COVID has demonstrated that global interconnectivity and interdependence is here to stay and is likely to increase and be in house. So, the sum, summing up basically, Cultures are continuing to rub up against each other, making intercultural learning both within the nations and across the nations more important. Now that's an important point that I'm, I mean, I am not at all sure whether the Akara's uh, uh, articulation of intercultural learning is nation specific or transnational, okay? We need to actually uh, perhaps uh, ask people who know about such matters. So what do these observ observations uh, indicate? They indicate, one, is that cultures are dynamic. As a result of interconnectivity, 
as a result of exchange, as a result of a whole range of new possibilities of shifts that are taking place, uh, the cultures are, cultural practices are constantly evolving as they encounter new conditions and new challenges. And COVID is one of those sites of new conditions and new challenges. The other thing that I want to point out is in the concept of intercultural, the notion of inter is potentially more important than culture. In other words, we don't do enough research on inter more that we actually quite often think about cultural when we talk about intercultural. In other words, it's the relationship that develop between dynamic cultures that are changing anyway, okay, that we need to focus much more on. And that actually is something that has come to, that's become clearer to me as I've, as, I, as I've thought about these issues. Solution to the problems of risk society demand communities to work with each other, to collaborate both within and across nations. Now, of course, it does not suggest that, the, that intercultural relationships are always positive. Sometimes they're negative. So what I'm arguing is that interculturalism is ubiquitous. Intercultural exchange is ordinary. It is banal. It is everywhere. What we need to work on is how do you steer the facts of intercultural exchange towards ethically and culturally and pedagogically productive forms of interculturalism. So in other words, the challenge is that of the normativity of intercultural exchange rather than the facts of interculturalism. Facts of interculturalism are well and truly behind us. It's already here. Okay, it's, it's, it's not something that we can uh, any longer debate. But we can debate the forms in which that intercultural relation should be directed. Uh, how and what, need, what could be done. Especially in a context in which uh, there is evidence, and there is in fact fact, of considerable asymmetry in the distribution of power. Okay, in other words, how do we develop ethically and culturally and uh, uh, pedagogically productive forms of interculturalism in conditions that retain and that have symmetrical, uh, asymmetrical distribution of power. And that is a question that uh, actually raises huge. Let me actually use this particular analysis, these are some generalizations that I've come up with, to look at what it is that we are trying to do and how it is that we need to think about intercultural uh, 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 understanding and intercultural learning differently. Let me actually have a look at uh, the ACARA's understanding of uh, Australian curriculum's understanding of intercultural understanding. The Australian curriculum, it says, this is a direct quote from their website, encourages students to develop intercultural understanding as they learn to value their own cultures, languages and beliefs and those of others. They come to understand how personal group and national identities are shaped and the variable and changing nature of culture. The capability involves students in learning about and engaging with diverse cultures in ways that, are, that, that recognize commonalities and differences, create connection with others and cultivate mutual respects. Now, perfectly fine. Um, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm all for it. But there are certain assumptions that are built into it, okay, that I think we need to actually um, deconstruct, if you like. The assumption is that cultures exist. So dynamism of culture is not being highlighted. What is highlighted is cultures exist and how do they actually come together. In other words, the first notion, the prior notion, is that of culture rather than inter. Okay. In other words, instead of looking at cultural interaction and cultural exchange, what the document is doing is sort of saying, let's look at cultures and how do they come together. Intercultural understanding, it says quite rightly, is an essential part of living uh, with others in diverse world of, uh, of the 21st century. It assists young people to become responsible global, local and global citizens, equipped uh, 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 through their education for living and working together 
an interconnected world. There is only one word that I would quibble with here, and that is the word others. Okay? How are others defined in this particular? How are others understood? Okay? And who is the other? <laughs> and how do we actually recognize some people as others and not others? So it actually raises some interesting questions. So in the Australian curriculum, as it currently is articulated, intercultural understanding, uh, in the intercultural understanding and learning continuum is organized around three interrelated organizing concepts, elements. This is again from my reading of, uh, of the Australian curriculum. Okay, recognizing culture and developing respects. Culture is presented as there that needs to be respected instead of part of the logic of interculturality. So interculturality produces culture rather than cultures and bringing together cultures produce interculturality. It's flipping the coin. That's actually what I'm suggesting. Okay, interacting and empathizing with others. Again, other is othered <laughs> as opposed to thought about it. Reflecting on intercultural experiences and taking responsibility. In my view, I would change the order and I would bring the third point, the first point, <laughs> rather than um, uh, other way around. In other words, we need to actually reflect on intercultural experiences that are ubiquitous, banal, ordinary, organic, everywhere. Okay? It's happening here in this room. Okay? There is an element of interculturality that is evident here. Okay? I'm speaking from a particular cultural position. And as you talk to each other, you do the same. In other words, how do we deconstruct interculturality in order to understand how cultures are produced in the first place? Cultures are not produced. They do not exist somewhere prior to interculturality. Interculturality produces cultures. Okay? It results in cultures. So as a result, the differences that we notice that, uh, um, that, that are regarded as culturally different are produced through historical and political struggles and forces. I always give the example of the creation of Pakistan. All of a sudden, on one particular day, the state of Pakistan and an ethnic group called Pakistani came into existence, boom, just like that, at midnight on 15th of August, 1947. In other words, there was no such thing as Pakistani culture. There was no such thing as Pakistani. You know. It was created as a result of a political action of a particular kind. Okay? And that is the case with most cultures. As we become more and more inter, inter, interrelated, uh, as and when uh, relationships between different cultural traditions produce new cultural formations, then, to my mind, interculturality is the aspect that needs to be looked at before we start looking at and defining particular cultures. I have no idea what Pakistani culture is, okay? And I don't think Pakistanis do either. And yet, uh, they actually say that, that there is a culture there. So what is the politics that produced that culture in a particular way, which made it different to the cultures in Northern India, for example, from where most of the people who went to Pakistan were born? So, what I'm saying is we've got to actually move away from um, a fairly banal kind of understanding of multiculturalism based on diversity of culture to a focus on interculturality, from multiculturalism to interculturalism. So intercultural means that there is an interaction between two or more cultural traditions. Multicultural, on the one hand, something that pertains to or is represented by many different cultures. The difference here and the significant is one is focused on interaction and the other is focused on representation. Okay? What, so multiculturalism is based on representation. Interculturalism, as I am articulating it, is based on interaction. In other words, we need to understand the nature of uh, interaction, the conditions under which they happen, the conditions under which they can be steered towards different directions, more productive directions. And we need to ask questions that are, that, uh, that are important in that respect. So in its normative terms, interculturalism implies the need 
for comprehensive mutuality, reciprocity, and equality. Okay. There are mutually reciprocal relationships among and people between cultures. People from different cultural groups interact with each other, learn and grow together, build relationships, uh, uh, become transformed, shaped, and molded with, from each other's uh, experience. One of the things that I often uh, wonder and think about is my daughters um, and then my granddaughters, okay, uh, all, all girls. <laughs> um, they have multiple cultures in their background. My wife is uh, Jewish. Of, uh, I was born in, in more northern India, lived here. My, my son-in-law is Irish, my son, other son-in-law. These kids have difficulty <laughs> saying what culture they are. And yet, in schools, they're constantly challenged to say something about their culture and its representation. Okay? They are, they are asked that, and they're deeply embarrassed by that question. They're deeply troubled. Now, if we should shift it to how your cultural understanding and cultural practices is a product of interculturality, then we have a little more um, uh, a, a comfortable place to, to, to have a discussion in. Okay? In other words, we look at the ways in which interculturality produces. It may be that one of my daughters might say that they prefer to be Indian, but they have made a choice about that. Okay? They have made a choice about that out of the multiple options that were available to them. And Aboriginal people, when they regard themselves as Aboriginal, then they have a right to do so and do not want to be uh, abused by Andrew Bolt for doing so. Okay? Uh, in other words, they need to, need to, need to, need, if, if, you, if you want to say that, you know, my Irish heritage or my English heritage or Scottish heritage does not matter as much as my Aboriginal heritage, then you have decided to actually frame your culture in a particular way, instead of it being imposed upon you. The focus is therefore on relationship building, not on maintenance of cultures, because they're changing, they're dynamic. Deep connections, interactions, mutual gifting, respect, learning from each other. These things become much more important. No one is left unchanged as a result of intercultural processes. Some examine their own culture more deeply and define it in their own way, and some are changed through their interaction with others. And indeed, the contemporary Aboriginal experience is precisely one that has actually emerged out of 250 years or thereabouts of interaction, okay? And as a result, the choices that they are making of political claims are dependent on their understanding of that history and also their visualization or revisualization of their futures in a particular way. And that's what Uluru is all about. Uluru is trying to define a set of foundational conditions under which certain rights are given to them that the notion of unceded did not. Okay, so learning about this allows us to actually learn about the contingency of cultural formation, the, the dynamics of cultural formation, learning about what it means to be community together, racial and cultural power in Belsis and how they might be addressed. And people are able to learn from each other and lead to the transformation of groups and people. Now, what, in my view, this all means is that the post-COVID conditions have highlighted the importance of understanding the processes of intercultural exchange, not only within a community, but across communities and potentially around the world, okay, uh, because of the... And the formation and the constantly evolving uh, new practices of uh, new cultural formations. Under the conditions of risk, vulnerability, and moral, economic, cultural and economic hazards. So what we are looking at is a set of conditions in which uh, we have considerable hazard, considerable risk, and if uh, 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 Tony Giddens and, uh, and Ulbrich uh, to be recognized, then this is likely to be a, a almost like growing and more intense state. Then we need to actually look at how it, and of course that raises the question of what kind of educational virtues do we need to focus on? What kind of ways in which 
we approach the study of interculturality rather than the culture in order to form intercultural relations. And here, I think the value, the, the, there are certain virtues that I've been writing about over the last 10 years and have become increasingly, these virtues are not eight, six separate virtues. They're intersecting virtues. They're related to each other. They're, they're about curiosity, about empathy, and more particularly about relationality. And where do these relationalities come from? Okay, how is it that we produce those conditions of interculturality? And what are the conditions of interculturality that allow some people to express their cultural framing and cultural representations in ways that is relatively privileged while other people are not so given that opportunity? Okay, we need to actually understand these as emerging from the processes of historical transformations of various kinds. Okay, so historicity, not learning about history, but historicizing interculturality becomes really quite important. And I'm looking at Julie who does this kind of work. Okay, it means the self-reflexivity becomes really important. Looking at ourselves and sort of saying, how are we product of interculturality? And of course, this also raises the issue of criticality. What kind of criti critical self-understanding we can develop as a result of uh, this? Now, the critical function of this kind of pedagogic approach is to reveal what is often assumed or hidden or unconscious, so as to render the interculturality available for understanding, examination, and potential transformation. Critique might thus aim at, intercultur uh, that thus aim at intercultural stereotypes and prejudices, and hence the habits of mind that underpin them. And yet, it would be more concerned with how it could compel us towards a self-reflexive awareness of our own historicity and contestability, and hence our own creative capacities. Okay, how it is that we can be creative in negotiating the conditions of interculturality. In other words, we need to actually make a distinction between interculturality as a fact and interculturality as a value. Okay, interculturality that is already happening, that requires an empirical understanding, okay, and interculturality that we are aspiring to normatively, morally, ethically. The question becomes, how do we relate those, those two? How do we actually jump from facts to values? Okay, how do we determine how a particular understanding and they're always contingent, they're always uh, tentative, they're always provisional, and they're always informed by our prior understanding, historically speaking. How do we use that understanding of how the world is connecting with each other and how we relate to each other to drive it towards a normative form of interculturality? In other words, how do we go from the empirical to the normative? Okay, and that is a question that is a very old philosophical question going back to David Hume. And more recently, um, uh, recently, early part of the 19th, 20th century by um, Bloomsbury philosopher um, uh, George, George Moore, who wrote quite extensively about a thing called naturalistic fallacy, in which he tried to say that the relationship between facts and values is a really quite complicated one. But it's one of those most fundamental aspects of our human institutions, social institutions. So we try to figure out how it is what we study in our research can be used to drive towards appropriate normativity, an appropriate form of moral outlook, if you like. In other words, uh, the, what is the nature of the relationship? Now in this, of course, critique is always important. And it consists in continually interrogating both the current and the long-held assumptions of our own cultural positioning, emerging out of the interculturality and our intercultural relations, uh, as well as those of uh, um, those ones we regard as our others or foreign. Genuine understanding dialogue and exchange between uh, across cultures and across traditions and across, um, uh, across uh, various uh, uh, regions of the world is not possible unless we, all of us, 
open up our fundamental assumptions to interpretation, to understanding, to contestation, to experimentation, and to transformation. Without this opening up, intercultural communication and intercultural learning may be reduced to outward tolerance or even non-engagement. Engagement that is non-engagement of the kind that settler col col colonial authorities assumed uh, when they tried to think about uh, their complex relationship with the indigenous people. Critique in this sense, in this, this productive sense, could in fact be indispensable in promoting intercultural exchange and harmony. Its goal is not the convergence of values and practices, rather it is to keep alive an open-mindedness but critical spirit of intercultural uh, inquiry in which interculturality lies at the heart of our understanding rather than some putative and some assumed representations of cultures. Thank you very much. On behalf of everyone, thank you for a really compelling and stimulating presentation tonight. I, I'm sure we've all got uh, many things to, to ruminate over now, um, and certainly for me, um, without going back through the, the whole lecture, but it was fascinating to think about where we're, in, where we're at in Australia right now, listening to you talk about that transformation. And um, uh, it, it, it's really interesting that I think what saved us during COVID is going to expose us post-COVID. And the idea that we're an island and we're able to contain ourselves without the virus creeping in um, is, is, going to, is going to cause us difficulties as we go forward with the geopolitics changing as quickly as it has. And um, that intercultural understanding and intercultural learning not being such a priority in Australia, in an Australian schools. And so I, I felt the urgency during your presentation to think more about what we need to do to be able to make that into the priority that it has to be for young people who are going to move into leadership and, and into society to, um, to protect themselves in terms of jobs and the economy and everything else that, that really matters. So as you know, I'm the chair of the Asia Education Foundation and I get access to the leaders in, um, in this area in every single um, state uh, system and it's just not the priority. And, and I feel certain that the video that we're going to put on our YouTube channel will probably be the most, be the most watched Dean's lecture we've ever had because, because this is what people need to be thinking about and being stimulated by people like you. So on behalf of everyone, can I thank you for the, the uh, fantastic presentation and the enormous effort that you went to to make sure that um, we restarted our Dean's lecture process at the highest possible level. So thank you very much.